been in a series called Why Blank Matters. And we've been talking about how, again, uh, uh, not everything is created equal in terms of um, what we need to emphasize in our life, how, sh how shame, how, you know, just much of a bummer it would be to be great at the things that matter a lot less and to fail at the things that really, really matter. And, uh, and so we've been talking about things like forgiveness and we've been talking about things like sex and we've been talking about uh, uh, you know, things like faith and why these things matter. And they seem to matter um, in abnormal amount. They seem to matter to a greater degree. And, and today I wanna talk about why prayer matters, why prayer matters. Now, I've been following Jesus uh, for 20 years now, actually in, in March, it'll be 20 years um, since I became, uh, became a Christian. And I've been a, a professional Christian for about 15 years uh, as a pastor. And, um, and, and I gotta be honest, of all spiritual disciplines and of all, and of all the things, things like reading God's word, things like worship, things like fasting, things like evangel evangelism, like, like of all spiritual disciplines, I gotta be honest, I feel like prayer is the one that I've never been in a season of my life where I thought, I pray enough. I, I don't know about you, I, I've been talking to people a long time. I've never talked to somebody that was like, you know what? I pray enough. I, I, I just have never talked. There's been other spiritual disciplines that I felt like, man, I'm in the groove right now with getting in God's word. I'm in a groove right now with, you know, with you know, different things like generosity and things like that. I've never been in a place where I thought I pray enough. And, and I really believe that's because there is a longing in our heart to be with God. There's just this longing in our heart to, ju to just, man, man, man how, how, do I, how do I draw and continually draw closer to God? And I, I wanna read out of Matthew chapter six, and then we're, we're gonna read out of Luke chapter 11. And oftentimes these moments get lumped together, but these are really two separate occasions where Jesus talks about what we have come to call the Lord's Prayer. And there are two separate occasions. One of them is in Matthew chapter six, verse seven. And, uh, this is right in the middle of his Sermon on the Mount, his famous sermon. And in verse seven, he says this, he says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Don't be like them. Now, what I think is funny about this is there undoubtedly would have been Gentiles like in the audience. So Jesus is like, hey, don't be like those guys right there, them right there, rows four and five. He says, don't be like them, for your father knows what you need even before you ask him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then in Luke chapter 11, verse one, this is a separate occasion. So that was, that was him teaching the masses to pray. And then in Luke chapter 11, verse one, it says this, it says, now Jesus was praying in a certain place and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John has taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. So he gives kind of an abbreviated version that he gives in his Sermon on the Mount. He goes on to say, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you though, he will not get up and give him anything because he is a friend. Yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. I love this in verse nine. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Come on, let's pray together today over the preaching of God's word. God, what an honor it is today to be in your house. Uh, God, I pray, God, that you would let our hearts be molded by the time spent with you. Give us an even greater desire to draw near to you in prayer, God. When we leave here, uh, God, let us just, uh, man, lean into this longing to be with you. I love you and we need you. In Jesus' name, we all said, Amen and amen. Um, <laughs> that was cute. Uh, uh, now, uh, I don't know if you have like, you know, nieces and nephews. Christine and I have, we have a niece and we have a nephew and, uh, and, and we, love to, we love to get them things. We, we, we love to, to purchase them things and to get them stuff for the holidays and their birthdays and things of that nature. However, uh, a couple years ago, this started to change for me. Started to change for me. I started to enjoy it a little less. 
And, I, and I'll, t- I'll tell you why. You're like, man, that's weird. Uh, uh, but I'll tell you why. Because um, it used to be whenever there'd be a holiday coming up until a couple years ago, whenever there would be a birthday or something like that, um, we would call them up. We'd probably FaceTime with them. And, and while we were talking to them, uh, we would bring up, hey, you have a birthday coming up. Uh, what are a few things that you really, really want? And they would begin to express some of these things. You could tell that they would think really, really hard about this, and they would, they would think about it in real time, and, and there is a face-to-face interaction that is taking place. And, 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 and I go, okay, and they, they would tell us a few things, and then we'd go, okay, cool, and, and we'd pick out of those things, and we would, we would get them something, and we'd send it to them. They live in Washington State, and so FaceTime is clutch, and I and, uh, thought this was an amazing experience. Well, a couple years ago, they started doing this new thing where they would go on. Now, now I'm not even sure the delivery system for this. I I don't even know the website. But what they would do is they would go on this thing throughout the year, and they would add gifts to it, like a gifts registry. Like, this is like a thing now, I guess, right? And these little kids, these like seven and nine-year-olds would go on, and they, if, if there was something they wanted in that season, they would, they would add it to their gifts. And so this blew me away the first time that I talked to them when they started doing this. And I was FaceTiming them. There was, Christmas was coming up. And I'm like, well, well, hey, what do you want for Christmas? And they told me to go to their registry. <laughs> like, Uncle Andrew, just, just, just go to our registry. And I'm like, well, you, you ain't getting married. What do you mean go to your registry? You ain't having a baby? Like, like what do you mean go to your registry? And, and, and their mom and dad uh, told us that, that this was a new thing that they were doing, that this, you know, things that as they were going throughout the year. But my problem with it was, yeah, but like, I'm a grown man, and there are things that I wanted six months ago that I don't want today. So, so as a child, like, like what if they put something on there, and then I end up getting them something that they don't even really, really want, and I feel like that you're putting a middleman between my niece and nephew, and I don't like it. I, I, I feel like it, it is removing the relational component of gift giving uh, in order for me to ask them what they want and for them to think about it in real time. And I think what is interesting a lot of times is we have to be careful as it pertains to how we see prayer. We gotta be really careful as to how we see prayer. Because I think when we pray, there's actually more going on than we realize. There are more things at play when you pray. In fact, um, the best way to kind of surmise it is, is uh, you know, there's these new memes. Now, I'm not very up on game. I'm an old 37-year-old. You need to know that. I'm an old 37-year-old. And uh, don't say yep, one of our GCLI students. Um, um, she's the same one that always tells me, my mom's the same age as you. Like, so many things running through my mind right now. Um, where was I? And, and, and so there's these memes. So, 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 there's these, so there's these memes that are out right now. That I don't know if you've seen these things, uh, but, it, but it will say something like, it'll say something to this effect. Um, what I think I look like when I'm in the rain. And it will have like a picture of some like supermodel with rain and, and, and it'll look amazing. And, and then right next to it, it will say what I actually look like when I'm walking in the rain. And it'll have like a picture of like a homely looking dog like, like in the rain, like looking terrible, right? And, and so, so there's this meme that's going out, what I think I look like versus what I actually look like or what I think I am versus what I actually am or what I think I'll experience versus what I'll actually experience. And if I were to illustrate prayer, If I were to do this with prayer, I think if I were to illustrate prayer, I I, I would probably illustrate this. I'd probably say what we think prayer is, and there'd be a picture of us handing a grocery list to God. I I think if we were to think about prayer in terms of that, I I think what I think prayer looks like would be us handing a grocery list to God. But then if the next picture over next to it was what prayer actually is, I think it would look more like a chisel being taken to our heart. That, that, that it, it would actually be an instrument that is, that is shaping our heart rather than us handing a grocery list to God. Did, did you know, like when I was younger, I used to think this. I used to think that prayer was about getting something. But the reality is prayer is about becoming something. Prayer isn't about getting something. Prayer, in, in fact, even the way we talk about prayer keeps us on that path because we will say things like, God either answered my prayer or he didn't answer my prayer. And what we mean when we say that is, I either got what I wanted from God or I did not get what I wanted from God. And that is a bad way to look at prayer. Because prayer is not about what I get, prayer is about actually being with God. 
You and I need more functionality to our prayer life. In fact, um, you know you're an adult. You know you're an adult when? Christine and I, uh, when Christmas rolls around, uh, uh, we don't get actually tons of gifts for each other. We kind of reserve that for birthdays and anniversaries. We don't get tons, of, we, we, give, we give each other a book, uh, we do stockings, but we don't do like, like big gifts for each other on Christmas. Instead, what we do is we look around the house and we go, what do we need that is a bigger purchase, uh, that, you know, something that is like functionality that we need that we can get us for Christmas? and you know you are an adult when you get height on a refrigerator. That's when you have graduated into adulthood. Like when you go to Home Depot and you're like, oh snap. This one holds pictures. This one can look in my refrigerator and it tells me what I need. You know you're an adult when you're like front load washer and dryer. Like you know you're an adult. And so Christine and I will go, like, what do we need? And we'll, and, and we'll get hype. Why? Because when you're younger, you're not thinking about functionality. But the older you get, you're like, man, I, I need some functionality to my gifts. I, I, I need some things that, that I can actually use. And, and my, my, my thought is, is this, is I think a lot of times you and I, we don't need more form for our prayer. We need more functionality. We need functionality in our time with God. We need functionality in our prayer life. And, and, it, it, and when it comes to our relationship with God, when it comes to our prayer life, I think a lot of times we're looking for form. In fact, I would even dare argue that many times we're looking for God to simply agree with us. We're just, in fact, I would even say, if God's voice always sounds like yours, and if God always agrees with you, I don't know that you're talking to God. I think you're having like an inner dialogue. I, I, I think you're just talking to yourself. I think like, should I date him or not? Yes, that was fast. Okay, right? It's just, <laughs> should we purchase that thing we can't afford? Yes, okay, that was fast. You're fast, God, you're fast. You and I gotta be really careful that God's voice just doesn't always, so sometimes in prayer, God's like, nope. Nope, you're on, the right, you're on the wrong track. Nope, you gotta move over to the right, you gotta move over to the left. In fact, here's my point, my only point is this, is that prayer is the forming of our will to better align with God's. That's what prayer is. Prayer is not simply bringing our request. Do we bring our request before God? Absolutely. He is our provider. But that is a byproduct of me spending time with God and my will being formed to him. That's why, again, another passage we misinterpret a lot, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. See, what you have to understand is the more you delight yourself in God, the more the desires of your heart are his desires for your life. And so, of course, you get the things as you become more like Jesus because you are desiring the things that he wants you to desire. And I love what's going on in this, in this passage because Jesus is, again, the master teacher. And he says this, he says, when you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do for they think they'll be heard for their many words. Do not be like them for your father knows what you need even before you ask him. See, I think sometimes we feel like we gotta impress God. You, you ever been in an environment where you just really wanted to impress somebody? Well, we've, all, we've all been in those environments where you really wanted to impress somebody, when you, maybe when you first start dating somebody. And uh, in, in fact, I remember um, uh, mine and Christina's first date. I remember our very first date. Um, we got set up on a blind date. We were in college and uh, we got set up on a blind date. I had known who she was. She had a great reputation. She knew who I was. I did not have a great reputation. And, uh, um, and, uh, and so we got, we got set up on this blind date. And, uh, and that night that we were going out, we were going to Starbucks. I believe that coffee is a great first date. If you're um, here and you're a young man and you uh, see somebody else in our church right now, like right now you could probably see them. Uh, in fact, you sat where you sat today uh, because of where they sit. Uh, uh, and I'm telling you, Starbucks coffee is just a good first date because it can be five minutes, it could be two hours. You decide, you know, it's, a, it's just a good, good first date. And, uh, but that night, I had a night class. So every night on that Tuesday night, I would have a night class. Now, usually when I showed up to this night class, uh, I would just wear sweats and a hoodie because it was my last thing of the day. I had a night class and then that would be it. I had like four teammates that were also in the class. And, uh, and so, but on this particular night, I dressed a little differently because I was going out with the Christina Reisner, okay? And, and, and so, so I show up to the class and I'm like dressed, right? It wasn't like I was wearing like a suit and tie, but I was just wearing clothes. 
You know what I mean? Like regular clothes, like, like adult clothes. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and so right when I walk in, my teammates were like, like, what, what are you doing tonight? Like, like, like wh- where are you going? I was like, well, you know, you know, like when you try to downplay something, but you're not really trying to downplay it, you're trying to upplay it. Like, I was like, oh, no, no, no I'm going nowhere. No, no, no. But ask me again, ask me again. <laughs> I said, no, where are you going? I said, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I have a date with, you know, Christina Reisner. And they were like, what? She's like really smart. That's what they said. Like, <laughs> felt real confident. But I dressed that night because, because I tried to imagine somebody that she would normally go out with and I tried to dress like him. <laughs> Why? Because, because I, I really wanted to, to impress. And, and, and what Jesus is telling his disciples, he said, hey, when you pray, when you come before God, don't try to impress. I think, I think sometimes what he's saying is don't try to impress God, but also don't try to impress people. Don't, don't worry about it. And can I tell you, as a pastor, I've been in lots of environments and I've been around people, man, that are just flat out, you're, you're afraid to pray. You're afraid to talk with God because especially if there's people around, you're like, okay, these people seem like they know the words a little more. Like, like they know, you know, to say God 45 times because God forgets his name in a prayer. <laughs> if that's for you, just wear it. That's okay, don't worry about it. <laughs> Thank you, Lord God, God, I pray, God, God, I pray, God, 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 pray, God, 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 pray, God, 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 God. <laughs> we get it, we know who you're talking to. <laughs> Hey, Andrew, good to see you, Andrew, 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 Andrew. Like, could you imagine doing that in any other conversation? I digress. I digress. Psychologically speaking, it does go to show how sometimes disconnected we feel from, but that's a different message, don't worry. But I remember uh, there was this young man, one of my all-time favorite uh, guys that I've ever had the honor of pastoring. Uh, uh, he was one of those guys, man, had a tough upbringing and just, man, just couldn't figure it out. I just love him to pieces. His name, his name was Mike, and, um, and I've, I'll never forget this. He had this line that was like brilliant. It was hilarious to me. Uh, and, uh, and I'd bring him with me if I went on, you know, if I was on a speaking trip or even just around church. And he was one of our interns. And so if I was praying for somebody, I'd always have him like, hey, you know, come. Or, or some of the other guys like, hey, hey come, come pray with this person. And, and there was a couple times where I'd be like, hey, Mike, come here. Hey, hey, come on in. We'd be praying for this high school student. And I'm like, okay, hey, Mike, hey, Mike, you want to pray? Hey, hey Mike, Mike, pray, pray for this guy. And this, he would say this line every time. This was his go-to line, and it was hilarious. It spoke to his heart, but it was very, very funny. He goes, no, nah, Pastor, you pray, I'll agree. <laughs> That's what he'd say. He'd say, no, no, you pray, I'll agree. Now, now, all of us, like, you know, or some of us in this room, like, you know what that means. Like, the, the agreeer in prayer is the person that's like, yeah, amen, yeah, yeah, amen. And that's what he would do. He's like, Pastor, you pray, I'll agree. Right? That's what he would say. And after a while of him doing this, I asked him, I go, Mike, I go, bro, you can pray. Like you and I eh, like talk all the time. Like, yeah, you can pray, you, you know what to pray. And he goes, ah, I'm just afraid of saying the wrong thing. Or, or, or I'm afraid of, of like, ah, I, I don't know, man. It seems like people here, they kind of know what they're doing. I'm like, dude, you have conversations with me all the time. It's just, just talk to God. Just begin to communicate with them. See, see, for some reason, I, I think uh, the enemy tries to use this in our life to, to think that, man, we don't know what to say to God. You want to know who God really wants to hear from? The authentic you. That's who God wants to hear from. He just wants to hear from the authentic you. Like, think about this for a second. Like, Justice right now, like, he does this thing where he goes, da 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 That's so he does that thing. And, he's, and, and he'll just start going, da 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 Now, he don't know what he's saying. But, but you know what I don't do? I'm like, well, Justice, be quiet. Until you can speak full, coherent, coherent sentences, I really need you to be quiet, son. Talk to me in a year, right? No, when he goes, da, 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 I try to get him to keep doing it. Da, 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 right? And I encourage it, and I'm hanging on every incoherent word that he says. Why? Because I just love to hear from my son. I just love to hear from him. I love to hear his voice. I love to hear the tone of his voice. I love to see him developing words. And I don't wait until he knows how to clearly articulate what he's feeling and what he's sensing on the inside. I just go, man, I just want to hear from you. And some of you, it's like you're waiting until, I don't know what, but until you're a super spiritual person uh, to talk to God. And God's just saying, no, Dad, like, just talk to me. And even if it starts out with that, 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 that's okay. But, but, but just start talking to me. Don't, don't worry about impressing me. And then in Luke chapter 11, verse one, it says that Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John has taught his 
disciples. So, so they say, like, Lord, teach us how to pray. And then he goes on, and again, an abbreviated version of what he preached on the Sermon on the Mount. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. You ever thought you were like, you know, pretty good at something until you read about or, or saw somebody else doing it at like a whole different level? Uh, in fact, one of my challenges as, as a new dad, you know, been a father for almost 15 months now, is how do I maintain uh, the same work ethic that I have, the same drive that I have there, and yet still be there for my kids? Uh, I don't know if anybody else, um, I'm sure I'm the only one that experiences that tension. Um, and uh, I've been trying to figure that out and been trying to ha employ new strategies and how do I get enough message prep time and how do I get enough time meeting with people and, and how do I do this while at the same time still being just wildly committed to, man, I wanna see my kids as much as possible. And, and I thought I was doing an okay job um, until um, I, I was actually reading this book. In fact, I started this book about a month ago and uh, I gotta be honest, and, and all of you, you know, probably know this, that um, last Sunday, uh, um, last Sunday morning, uh, Kobe Bryant, and, and his 13-year-old daughter and seven other people were killed in a just horrific uh, uh, helicopter crash. And, uh, and the book that I've been reading over the last about month, month and a half is Kobe Bryant's book, Mamba Mentality. And, um, and like you, you know, last week, you know, I was just heartbroken over the news. It was, it was devastating. And for me, Kobe Bryant was like the dude. Um, I mean, Kobe Bryant is just the man. I wore number 24. And he, uh, to be honest, even last Sunday night, I didn't really wanna preach last Sunday night. Um, I was just sick to my stomach, and, um, and I was reading his book. Christine and I were literally having this conversation a month ago uh, while I read this part uh, of his book, and he talked about how, you know, he, you know dad of four girls, and, uh, and he was talking about how he got to a point in his career where it's like, man, he was battling that tension as well. And say, man, how do I be there for my kids while at the same time still keeping up this insatiable work ethic? And one of the things that he had figured out is he, is he said, you know what I can do? Um, my kids go to bed around 8, 8.30. Uh, that means I can do a workout from about 10 to midnight, and then I can come home and sleep like 12, 12.30 to about 3.30, 4 o'clock, and then I can work out 4 to 6, and then I could be there for when my kids go to bed and when my kids get up, and I've worked out twice while they've been asleep. And I thought, man, I thought I was doing a pretty good job <laughs> until I read about and was convicted by that type of work ethic that would allow him to keep his work ethic high and, and to still invest in his children. See, the, the reality is, is that when these disciples come to Jesus and they ask him, they say, Lord, teach us to pray. These were not like secular people. These were not people that would have never prayed before. These were like Jewish boys that would have been taught to pray since they were born. From the time they could talk, they would have been taught the different prayers of the saints of old. They would have been taught to pray. So it is interesting that they would come to Jesus and say, teach us how to pray. What they instinctively knew just by watching Jesus' life is that you are getting something out of your prayer life that I am not getting. You are engaging something and you are praying in such a way that is different than the way that I'm praying. So show me and help me understand what that is means. And, and, and so Jesus goes through, right? It says, hallowed be your name. And, and I love, I'm going to take you through just kind of five things real quickly that, that are just help us understand the alignment that Jesus went through when he would pray. So the first part is worship. Did you know worship is prayer? So when we're, when we're singing these songs, like, like this is a part of our prayer life, right? So he says, hallowed be thy name. What is he doing? I mean, he's giving God his proper honor, his proper worship, putting him in his proper place because when we put God in his proper place, it inevitably puts us in our proper place as creation. You are God and I am not. This is a tension that you and I always face because whether we like to admit or not, we turn ourselves into little gods, C.S. Lewis says. And so every time we pray, every time we worship, it is a realignment and, and, and it is a proper alignment of how God created us. So it starts out with Father, hallowed be your name. Then it says your kingdom come. I think our prayer life ought to include a desire for God's kingdom. God, help me to care about the things that you care about. Help me to, help me to, to think about the things you think about. Then it goes on to say, give us each day our daily bread. I think a part of our prayer life is understanding provision. There's a reason why during parts of our service, we, we pray for the needs of our church. Why? Because uh, our help comes from the Lord. It com cometh not from the east or the west, our help comes from the Lord. And then this is a big one. We talked about this last week. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. I, I think when we forgive other people, 
and in turn we ourselves are forgiven, there's a purity of heart that's taking place that is incredibly important to our prayer life. And, and then finally, right, it says, and lead us not into temptation, goes on to say, but deliver us from evil. And what this is just acknowledging is saying, God, help me to love your ways. I, I love reading the Psalms. In fact, sometimes I think we, this has been lost in our culture. I love King David would pray, God, God I love your precepts. I love your ways. And I, I don't know about you, but in my prayer life, I always wanna include, God, help me to love the way you've set up life. Help me to love your boundaries. Help me to love just your precepts. Help me to love your thoughts on life. And Jesus helps them walk through this to get more out of their prayer life. And then he finishes with this interesting story. I'm gonna have the team come up, the worship team come up. Because he finishes with this story that this guy shows up to a friend's house and he's like, dude, I need to borrow some Wonder Bread. And I have a friend coming over. And, and it says, because of his impudence, because of his relentlessness, because he just keeps coming uh, to his friend, that finally his friend says, okay, uh, I'm gonna help you out. And so we are encouraged by Jesus to ask. We are encouraged by Jesus to seek. We are encouraged by Jesus to knock because he says, you know, the reality, reality is, is for everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. See, what, what happens in, in groups of people is that we become like one another the more time we spend with each other, right? This is why I'm just a firm believer. In fact, Craig Rochelle said this. He says, you know, if, if, if your church isn't accused of being a cult every once in a while, your culture is probably not as strong as you think it is. And, uh, and we're accused of being a cult every once in a while. So I think our culture is pretty strong. And, and uh, uh, I think we have a very strong culture. And what's interesting in, when you make observations about a really strong culture, there's a couple things you pick up. Like, for example, one of the things you pick up is everybody kind of starts to talk like each other. You ever notice this? Like, you ever notice this in families, like really tight-knit families? It's like they'll use the same words, even their voice inflections, even their tonality. It's like, man, they'll start to sound like each other. And, and sometimes when people are a part of the same group, you'll go, oh, that's interesting. They're, they see life very similarly and, and, and the way they think about it. And I think in our culture sometimes, because we're such an individualistic type of culture, we see that as a bad thing. I would argue that it's actually a good thing. It just shows proximity of relationship. It shows that, no, no, there's a culture in our family. Like my prayer is that the guard home would have a culture, that, that our kids would be kind to people. That would be a part of our culture, that, that they would think highly of people. That would be a part of our culture, that they would honor people that have different views and different, different belief systems. And that would be a part of our culture, that, that, that my prayer is that we have a culture in our home, that we have a culture in our church. And, and, and what happens is the, the more we are around each other, the more we are engaged with each other, the more we start to emulate one another. I think the same is true with God. The more time we spend with him, the more we start to sound like him. The, 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 more, the, the more we draw close to him, the more we start to think like him. In fact, it's kind of like tuning a guitar. Where, where, where's, uh, where, where, come here, come here. Uh, this guy's awesome, this guy, come on, give it up, give it up, give it up, give it up, give it up. Um, uh, now, now uh, what, what most of you in here know, you just probably know this instinctively, even if you've never played a guitar in your life, you know that the tuning of this instrument comes from these six little things sticking out here, right? In, in fact, if I, I'm not gonna do it, but if I started like moving these around, uh, uh, the, the, the tone that he, he could actually be playing the same chord that he was playing, but as soon as I started moving these around, it would then be out of tune. And, and, and I've been in environments, I've been in other churches. Our, churches don't, don't, our church doesn't do this because you guys are pros, you guys are amazing. But I've, I've been to other churches and I gotta be honest, it drives me crazy. There are times where I'm preaching and I'll invite the band out just like I do and I'm preaching my guts out and I'm giving everything I have and I'm sweating and, and all that stuff. And I'll hear a guy behind me tuning his guitar. Ding, 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 ding. And it's not playing over the speakers, but I can hear it. And I gotta be honest, it messes with my OCD. It just, it messes, I'm like. <laughs> There's been times where I wanted to turn, turn around and be like, dude, you're ruining everything right now. Everything. Holy Spirit left the room because you're back here. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> I've been in environments like that. I'm like, stop it. Drives me crazy. Our, our guys don't do that. You guys, you guys are amazing. I love our worship team. Aren't you grateful for Grace City Music? Come on. But the reality is this, but I also kind of get now, should that person do it? Nope, nope, they need to do it in the back room, right? But, but I kind of get it. 
And the reason why I get it is because in order to tune the guitar, you have to hear it. In order to tune the guitar, it's got to make a noise. You got to be able to hear it and you have to be able to hear if it's playing the right note or if it's playing the wrong note. Did you know that not just is your prayer life, you know, you drawing close to God in communion and God hearing the tone of your prayer life so then he can get you in tune. It's actually as much about you hearing the words that are coming out of your mouth while you pray so that God can tune you because all of us have had moments where we have said something and we went, whoa, that wasn't God. That's not how God thinks of people. Ah, that, that, that's not, and, and so what we have to do, listen, some of you, I think you're waiting to have the right tone before you pray and you don't get the right tone without praying. That's what we don't realize. And so we're waiting until like our heart is pure, till our heart is right. Can I just tell you, God can handle your frustrations. God can handle your anger. God can handle your confusion. God can handle those things. So you might as well just speak up to him because the Bible says he knows what you need even before you ask him. And God can handle that tone. In fact, he'd rather have you say things that are not in tune with how he thinks than have you keep it to yourself, thus you never hearing the sour tone in your ear, thus wanting to change it. By the way, this is what I think was so impressive about King David. Because there were times where he would speak and he was out of tune. See, like, that's why I find it so fascinating when we read the Psalms. Now, listen, you have to be careful when you read the Bible. Right? You have to be, because different parts of the Bible are designed to serve different purposes. And I think sometimes, this is where actually bad theology and bad doctrine takes place, is we assume everything in the Bible is there and designed to create doctrine, and that's not true. Like, like, like for example, uh, I'll give you a quick example, like, like Job. Like Job, right? Um, uh, Job goes, goes through a really difficult time, and, and Job makes this statement. Now, this is what he really said. He said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's what he said. But if you read Job, did the Lord taketh? No. The enemy, the devourer, the Bible talks about, is the one that took. Now, he's just communicating from his perspective what is taking place. And then what happens is, is that we actually create this bad doctrine that says, oh, the Lord takes stuff away from people. No, 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 not necessarily. Sometimes yes, a lot of times no. The Bible calls the enemy of our soul the, the great devourer. And that's what he does. When, when, when King David was writing some of the Psalms, he would say things like, Lord, kill my enemies. <laughs> he, he'd say stuff like that. Now, if you and I were praying right now, Lord, kill my enemies. Ding, 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 ding. Whoa. <laughs> Out of tune. See, the purpose of the Psalms is not to create doctrine that says it's okay to have enemies and to desire for them to be killed. That's not what the purpose of Psalms is. What Psalms is, is they were authentic expressions from a real heart that is really going through something. And, and David is speaking up. And because David is speaking up to God, even though what he was saying at times was wrong, God is able to tune because he's speaking up. Stop waiting to get your heart right. Because I think you and I, man, we gotta hear how out of tune we are sometimes. We, gotta, we just gotta hear it sometimes. And when we hear it, we can say, you know what, God, that's not my heart. That's not really what I want. And I know it's not your heart. Again, the purpose of prayer is not to get stuff. The purpose for prayer is communion with God. In fact, by the way, that's why Jesus Christ came and died is so that you and I could have, the Bible says, direct access to God, that you wouldn't need like a high priest anymore. Our high priest is Jesus, that you don't have to come to church and just only hear about God from me, that you get to go home today and you get to put your knees to the ground, put your forehead to the floor and say, God, I need you to move in my life. I need you to have your way in my life. God, I need you to realign me to the things of you. That's what prayer is all about, is simply communion with God. My prayer is this. In fact, this is my four Monday. I haven't done four Monday in forever, but I was thinking about it during this message. Here Here's a, here, for Monday is just a classic, just easy money takeaway. And, and, and here's what it is. Every day this week, just to get your prayer life activated, this is what I'd say. I want you to take five minutes right when you get up. I'm not talking about after you shower or after you have your cup of coffee. Five minutes 
right when you get up. And I just want you to do two things. Number one, I want you to tell God one thing you love about him. Just one thing. God, I love you that you're patient with me. God, I love you that you are kind, slow to anger and abounding in love. God, I love that your plans for me are good. Even though it doesn't always feel like that, God, I love that your plans for me are good. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for breath in my lungs today. I want you to tell him one thing that you love about him. And then the other thing, I, I just want you to, to tell him what you want out of that day. God, I pray today, God, that I would have focus like I rarely have. Help me to have just great focus today at work. Help me to have great focus today at school. Uh, God, I pray today I wouldn't be so irritable. At the end of today, God, let me walk with a levity today, just a joy and a peace today. God, I, I, I pray, God, that I would give you my very best today that everything I do, I would do with excellence. I, I, just, just one thing. God, at the end of today, when I rest my head back on this pillow, I ask you to do this. And then that will be a measurable thing that you will see God do in your life. I, I promise you, God wants to hear from you so that he can tune your heart into alignment with his will for your life. He's not afraid to hear the authentic, real stuff. I love that Psalms was recorded in the Bible for all of human history because we get to read sometimes. It's like, yeah, this is just where we're at. This is just reality. And God can handle it. Come on, let's stand to our feet, Grace City Church.